Chapter One of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter One: Franklin and Nashville. While Sherman was planning his march to the sea, General Hood was devising a counter-scheme of invasions. In spite of the rebuffs he had suffered at every encounter of arms since he had attained the object of his ambition by replacing Johnston, his hope and his courage had suffered no diminution. He had come to the West thoroughly imbued, as he says, with the spirit of Lee and Jackson. He thought by persisting in a series of flank attacks he would sooner or later destroy the National Army his courage and energy were equal to any demands that could be made upon them his mental capacity was so limited that he was unable to see the obstacles in his way even now after all the wasteful defeats which his rashness had inflicted upon his army he was dreaming of a succession of victories more brilliant than any which had illustrated the career of his great prototype in virginia although he had retreated from the front of sherman on the unanimous report of all officers he consulted that his army was in no condition to fight a pitched battle with sherman's force yet even while he halted at the crossroads he decided he says to cross the tennessee at countersville to destroy sherman's communications to move upon thomas and schofield and rout and capture their armies before they could reach nashville he intended then we are quoting his own words to march upon that city where he would supply his army and reinforce it by accessions from Tennessee. He would then march northeast, pass the Cumberland River, move into Kentucky, take position with his left at Richmond and his right at Hazel Green, then, threatening Cincinnati, recruit his army from Kentucky and Tennessee. The dream that had beguiled Kirby Smith still had power with Hood. The former state, he said, was reported at this juncture to be more aroused and embittered against the Federals than at any period of the war. He was imbued, he said, with the belief that he could accomplish this stupendous feat while Sherman was debating the alternative following him or marching through Georgia. But this scheme was merely the prelude to greater achievements. If Sherman should return to confront him, or should follow him from Georgia into Tennessee and Kentucky, he hoped then to be in condition to offer battle, and if blessed with victory, to send reinforcements to General Lee, or to march through the gaps in the Cumberland Mountains and take Grant in rear. Even if Sherman should beat him, he considered that this enterprise was still open to him. Thus, he says, he believed he could defeat Grant and allow General Lee, in command of our combined armies, to march upon Washington or turn upon and annihilate Sherman. This fantastic vision seemed as easy as good morning to the courageous heart and narrow mind of General Hood. Even as Sherman was to march southward, and little as he cared for what damage Hood might do in the rear, he was for a long time uncertain what course he should pursue in reference to him. On the 17th of October, he had said to Thomas that Hood would not dare to go into Tennessee. If he wants to, let him go, and then we can all turn on him and he cannot escape. And on the 26th, after his reconnaissance to Gadsden had revealed the fact that the rebel army had gone, he again said to Thomas, if it turns up at guntersville i will be after it but if it goes as i believe to decatur and beyond i must leave it to you at present and push for the heart of georgia even after he was satisfied that hood had gone towards decatur he told halleck that he would wait a few days to hear what headway hood was making and that he might yet turn to tennessee though it would be a great pity to take a step backward i think he adds with his humorous coolness it would be better even to let him ravage the state of Tennessee, provided he does not gobble up too many of our troops. Hood's intention, as we have seen, was really to cross at Guntersville, in which case he would have had Sherman upon his heels. But he postponed his ruin a few weeks by passing further west. The reason he gives for this course was his lack of cavalry and his desire to effect a junction with General Forrest before crossing. He did not even attempt to cross at Decatur, or at least the movement he made in this direction, which was promptly checked by General Granger in garrison there, with considerable loss to the Federates, Hood insists, was intended merely as a slight demonstration. 
Sherman, though he sometimes complains of Hood's baffling eccentricities, seems to have read his mind on many occasions like an open book. He telegraphed on the 28th of October, not knowing of the result at Decatur, that Hood would not assault that place and that Granger did not want too many men. The next day he received information of Hood's feeble demonstration against it and of Granger's successful sortie, in which he killed and wounded a considerable number of Confederates and captured over a hundred. Granger added his belief that Hood would go to Tuscumbia before crossing. He was evidently out of supplies, as the first thing the prisoners asked for was something to eat. Hood continued on his way west and reached Tuscumbia, on the south bank of the Tennessee, on the 31st of October. General Grant's doubts of the wisdom of Sherman's movement southward, which were so strong on this 1st of November that he recommended him to beat Hood before he started, gave way before Sherman's intense eagerness to be off, and on the 2nd, as we have seen, he gave his full consent. From that moment there was no question that one of the gravest responsibilities of the war rested upon the broad shoulders of General Thomas. This weighty load was well placed. Sherman said, General Thomas is well alive to the occasion, and better suited to the emergency than any man I have. He might have gone further and said that no man then alive on the continent was better suited to the work in hand. Grant, it is true, never rated Thomas at his real value, but he acquiesced in Sherman's opinion on this, as on almost all other occasions. Sherman's confidence was full and unlimited. He issued an order that in the event of military movements, or the accidents of war separating the general in command from his military division, Major General George H. Thomas, commanding the Department of the Cumberland, would exercise command over all the troops and garrisons not absolutely in the presence of the General-in-Chief. The departments of the Ohio and Tennessee were thus placed completely under his command. Thomas had not sought these honors or responsibilities. He accepted them most reluctantly. I do not wish, he said, to be in command of the defense of Tennessee unless you and the authorities in Washington deem it absolutely necessary. But having once accepted the charge, he executed it with all that human courage and human wisdom could bring to the task. During the whole month of November, the situation was extremely grave. Hood's army had, by the utmost exertion, been recruited up to its full strength. He himself says that desertions had ceased, and he started, at least, with his organization perfect and his subordinate generals entirely in harmony with him, now that Hardy was gone. With three corps of infantry, commanded by General S. D. Lee, Cheatham, and Stuart, comprising a force variously estimated at from 40,000 to 45,000, and he was accompanied beside by a formidable body of cavalry under Forrest of 10,000 to 12,000. Thomas's force was, on the 1st of November, greatly inferior to that of Hood. A large part of it was dispersed along the garrison post of the southern frontier of Tennessee, and this, of course, could not be displaced. His movable force he estimated at 22,000 infantry and a little over 4,000 cavalry. He received about this time some 12,000 new recruits from the north, but these did not make up his losses by the expiration of terms of service and by the furloughing of soldiers going north. The forces upon which he most relied were the 4th Corps, under Stanley, and the 23rd Corps, under Schofield and he was promised in addition to these an excellent corps under a j smith which had been serving temporarily under rosecrans at the time of the battle of nashville however thomas had at hand of all arms about fifty five thousand as soon as thomas learned that hood had appeared in force on the tennessee schofield and stanley were ordered to be concentrated at pulaski but before this could be accomplished forrest had made an attack at johnsonville one of Thomas's bases of supply on the Tennessee River, and after a feeble and discreditable resistance on the part of the garrison of the place, had caused the destruction of several transports and a large amount of valuable government property. Schofield arrived at Nashville on the 5th, when the advance of his corps was immediately dispatched to Johnsonville by rail. But on reaching there, he found that Forrest, having done all the damage possible, had retreated. Schofield left the place sufficiently garrisoned, and with the rest of his command 
marched to join the fourth corps at pulaski and to assume command of all the troops in that vicinity though stanley's commission as major general antedated this schofield had the higher rank as commander of a department his orders from thomas were to retard the advance of hood into tennessee as much as possible without risking a general engagement until smith's command should arrive from missouri and general j h wilson who had put in command of all the cavalry in the department and who came endorsed by grant with the prediction that he would increase the efficiency of that arm fifty per cent had time to remount the cavalry regiments whose horses had been taken for kilpatrick a fortnight had been spent by hood and beauregard at tuscumbia and the contemplated campaign discussed by them in all its bearings on the sixth of november hood telegraphed to jefferson davis his intention to move into tennessee to which mr davis answered that if sherman as reported had sent a large part of his force southward you may first beat him in detail and subsequently without serious obstruction or danger to the country in your rear advance to the ohio river on the twelfth which was the day on which communication ceased between sherman and thomas hood telegraphed again to the confederate president giving his reasons for not having fought sherman saying he did not then regard his army as in proper condition for a pitched battle but that it was now in excellent spirits and confidence he also accounted for his delays of the last few weeks by saying that forrest had not been able to join him that as soon as he could come up which would be in a few days he should move forward he moved across to florence on the north bank of the tennessee on the thirteenth forrest reported the next day and hood brought his entire army across the river sherman's intentions were not long a secret to the confederates and his formidable movement to the south being now fully developed beauregard ordered hood on the seventeenth of november to take the offensive at the earliest practicable moment striking the enemy while thus dispersed and by these means distract sherman's advance into georgia and on the same day telegraphing to general howell cobb who was reporting in panic and terror the advance of sherman beauregard said victory in tennessee will relieve georgia three days later beauregard again charged hood to push on active offensive immediately and on the twenty first hood with his usual alacrity put his army in motion feeling sure that he was to gain the victory so much needed and desired the storms which in sherman's neighborhood had been no more than refreshing showers in middle tennessee had turned the roads to mire neither schofield nor thomas believed that it was possible for the confederates to move in such weather but nevertheless hood pushed forward with his habitual vigor intent on coming upon schofield's rear and cutting him off from columbia and in this daring plan he almost succeeded in spite of snow sleet and rain he pushed northward and it was only by an equally vigorous and energetic march on the night from the twenty third to the twenty fourth of november that schofield reached columbia first forrest's cavalry was on the mount pleasant pike almost in sight of the town when cox's division moved at double quick marched across from the pulaski road and held back the confederates until stanley's head of column arrived and a strong position was taken up by the whole command covering the town on the south disappointed in his first effort to march around schofield hood determined to proceed by the right flank crossing the river some distance above columbia and move upon schofield's line of communications at spring hill he had not yet given up his hope of renewing in the west the exploits of stonewall jackson i had beheld he said with admiration the noble deeds and grand results achieved by the immortal jackson in similar maneuvers he waited only one day to prepare this movement and as he had always thought since the twenty second of july that if he had been present in hardy's flanking movement he could have destroyed mcpherson's army he determined this time to accomplish a closer imitation of jackson at chancellorsville by riding at the head of his own flanking column he bridged the river during the night of the twenty eighth three miles above columbia and crossing at daybreak he rode at the head of granbury's brigade of cleburne's division giving instructions to remaining corps in to follow and to keep well closed up he left general s d lee at columbia with two divisions and most of the artillery to make a heavy demonstration against schofield and to follow him if he retired 
in anticipation of this movement stanley had been sent with two divisions of the fourth corps to spring hill cox having been left at columbia to prevent or delay hood's crossing there colonel p s post's brigade was at the same time sent up the river in observation and soon reported the movement of infantry north of the stream fearing that this force the strength of which was not yet developed might come in upon the flank near rutherford's creek nathan kimball's division halted at that point while stanley passed on with g d wagner's division to spring hill where he arrived a little before noon in the meantime forrest had been encountered by wilson near hurt's corners and a brisk engagement took place between them forrest with his larger superior force gradually crowding wilson to the north in such a way as to give the confederates command of the direct road from rally hill to spring hill when stanley with his one division arrived at the latter point there was brisk skirmishing on every side of him for the possession of the road which increased throughout the afternoon the disposition made of wagner's division was admirably effective emerson opdyke's and j q lane's brigades covering the village and protecting the trains while l p bradley occupied a wooded knoll some three-quarters of a mile east of the pike which commanded the approaches from that direction by great good fortune wagner had not only his own battery of artillery but captain lyman bridges the artillery chief of the corps had come up with six more batteries not with any idea of fighting a battle but simply to get them as far as possible on the road to franklin but the moment he arrived at spring hill scenting the conflict he placed all his guns and battery on a commanding point west of the road where they did efficient service the first demonstration upon the place came from cheatham's corps which hood accompanied in person having left stewart's corps at rutherford's creek claiborne's division one of the finest in the confederate army under command of a general whose fighting qualities were proverbial was so hotly received by bradley's small brigade and by the utterly disproportionate fire from bridges batteries that it was impossible for the confederates to believe that the force opposed to them was so small bradley's brigade was however very roughly handled its heroic commander being severely wounded it fell back under charge of colonel joseph conrad towards the road and there with lane's and opdyke's brigades made so stout a resistance that evening came on to hood's almost frantic disappointment before the franklin pike was reached as he saw himself missing the great stroke upon which he had built such hopes he assailed his generals with furious reproaches and adjurations bringing up stuart from rutherford's creek he threw him to the right of cheatham with orders to take the pike at all hazards although night had already fallen but it was too late stuart's men went into bivouac within a few hundred yards of the road which wagner's division by good fighting and admirable judgment on the part of everybody concerned still held and with it the salvation of schofield's army general lee had succeeded in retaining general cox with the twenty-third corps all day at columbia in the afternoon schofield becoming convinced that hood with his main army was moving upon his rear ordered cox to withdraw as soon as it was dark he himself took t h ruger's division and pushed for spring hill the enemy was so close to the road that schofield had repeatedly to brush his pickets away from the path as he advanced he reached spring hill about seven o'clock and there learned that thompson's station a few miles further north was occupied by the enemy posting a strong force to the east of the road to protect his marching column he hurried on with Ruger's division to Thompson's station, the enemy retiring as he approached. He then returned to Spring Hill, meeting there the head of Cox's column, which had come up with the greatest celerity from Columbia. The whole force then started for Franklin, and marched all night with its heavy trains and invaluable artillery past the sleeping army of Hood. Several times during the night the trains were delayed by slight obstructions, and it seemed as if they must be abandoned or a battle be fought to save them but by mingled good fortune and good management they all got through the head of the column arriving at franklin a little before daylight on the thirtieth and the rest coming up during the forenoon schofield's orders were to cross the harpeth river to hold hood in check there and retire gradually upon nashville for thomas now felt ready to fight at that place 
smith's detachment of the army of the tennessee had at last begun to arrive from missouri and thomas was now equal or superior in infantry to hood but to schofield's surprise and annoyance he found no means of crossing the river he had destroyed his pontoons at columbia they being too heavy and cumbrous for the transportation at his disposition those he had requested from nashville had not been set the light and movable train which had belonged to thomas's army had gone with sherman to georgia a staff and an army like that of schofield's waste no time in regrets they scarped the banks on both sides of the river and made a sort of ford they tore several houses to pieces and with the planking floored the railroad bridge they sawed the old posts of the country bridge down to the level of the water and hastily covered the stumps with planks thus in a few hours they had three practicable bridges and began at once crossing the artillery and trains t j wood's division with some guns took position in an abandoned work called fort granger on the north side where they commanded the bridges but while these operations were going on it became necessary to provide for receiving hood's attack on the other side of the village the twenty third corps was posted on both sides of the main road upon which hood's army was expected the village of franklin stands in a bend of the harpeth river so that cox who commanded the lines had his left on the stream and extended across the columbia pike to the carter's creek pike but could not reach the bend of the river on the other side kimball's division was therefore given the duty of closing the line on that flank the instant the men were assigned their positions they went to work with instinctive alacrity to build such slight breastwork as the means at hand afforded the roadway was left open to enable a double line of wagons and artillery to pass and this opening was protected by a retrenchment a few rods further back wagner's division which had held the lines at spring hill all the day before and which had brought up the rear in a long night march came in about noon colonel opdyke's brigade which had formed the rear guard and upon which had fallen the double duty of beating back hood's advance and driving forward the weary and limping recruits of the schofield's army now came inside the lines and was posted as a reserve in rear of the centre wagner's other two brigades were left outside the principal line about half a mile forward on the columbia pike with instructions to observe the enemy and to retire as soon as the confederates showed a disposition to advance in force the weary soldiers threw themselves down for a little repose behind their breastworks neither schofield nor his corps commander imagined that a great battle was to burst upon them in a few moments the artillery and trains were nearly all across the river by the middle of the afternoon and schofield had issued orders for the troops to pass over at six o'clock but there was a state of things in the confederate army which made any moderate or prudent measures impossible to hood his failure to destroy schofield at spring hill had so embittered and exasperated him that he was ready for any enterprise however desperate the irritation had communicated itself to his principal officers his reproaches had stung them beyond endurance and therefore on arriving in sight of schofield's army in position on the south bank of the harpeth there was no thought of anything among the confederate commanders but immediate and furious attack all the confederate accounts agree in describing the spirit in hood's army on the morning of the thirtieth of november though hood and his generals entirely disagree to the cause of it generals cheatham and john c brown and according to their account general cleburne also ascribed it to hood's unreasonable and angry censures of their conduct the day before while hood attributes the new spirit of the army to mortification for the great opportunity lost and a renewed assess of admiration and confidence towards himself the assault was made at about four o'clock the confederates never rushed forward to battle with more furious impetus and by a strange accident it seemed for a moment as if this desperate assault of hood was to succeed and he was to gain the glory he so ardently longed for of a success like stonewall jackson's best wagner's two brigades that had been left outside the line with instructions to retire before becoming actually engaged with the enemy stayed too long the wide and heavy lines of cheatham and stewart had enveloped them on both flanks and the bayonets of the hood center were almost touching them when they turned and ran for the union lines 
they rushed over the parapets on either side of the pike the confederates following immediately after them overwhelming and carrying to the rear the troops who were defending the breastworks a gap of about one thousand feet was instantly made in the union lines hood's battalions were rapidly converging to this point if the damage were not immediately repaired it would be irreparable with the superior force wedged into the Union center, short work would have been made of the two wings, and nothing but annihilation would have been left for Schofield's army. General D. S. Stanley, the commander of the Fourth Corps, seeing from the north side of the river the Confederate advance, started at the instant for his line. He reached it just as the breach was made and the confused mass of fugitives and Confederates came pouring to the rear. The only force available at the instant to meet them was Opdyke's brigade, which had fought all the day before at Spring Hill, and afterwards had marched all night. But even while Stanley was galloping to order Opdyke to lead his men to the charge, he saw that gallant commander taking position himself on the right of his line. Seeing that no orders were necessary, he gave none, but placed himself at the left of this heroic brigade. A shout rose among the veteran soldiers about him. We can go where the general can, and the brigade, supported on the right and left by Cox's men, who instantly rallied to the rescue, rushed forward and regained the lines. Opdyke's magnificent courage met its adequate reward. He fought on horseback till his revolver was empty, then dealt about him with the butt of his pistol, and descending from his horse, seized the musket of a fallen soldier and fought like a private until the entrenchments were regained although four regimental commanders fell in this furious charge opdyke was unhurt stanley did not fare so well his horse was killed under him and he received a serious wound in the neck and was carried to the rear the battle did not cease with its fierce onset and repulse all along the line the confederates made attack after attack hood sitting on horseback a little way behind his lines sent them forward again and again with furious orders to drive the Yankees into the river. To show with what desperate gallantry the Confederates were led, it need only be said that six generals were killed on or near the parapets, six were wounded, and one captured. Cleburne closed his brilliant career in front of the Union breastworks. John Adams charged his horse over the ditch, leaped it, and horse and rider were killed upon the parapet. General O. F. Strahl fought with his men in the ditch until evening came. He was struck down. He turned over the command to Colonel F. E. P. Stafford, but while his men were carrying him to the rear, he was struck twice more and killed. Stafford took up his fallen sword and carried on the fight with courage which will form the theme of fable and legend in time to come. An eyewitness says that his men were piled about him in such numbers that when at last he was shot dead he could not fall, but was found the next morning partially upright, as is still commanding the gallant dead who surrounded him. Along the whole line, the attack and defense were carried on until nothing but the flashes of the muskets could be seen in the darkness, with the same furious gallantry on the one side and the same immovable determination on the other. Few battles so frightfully destructive are recorded in the wars of modern times. In the terrible fight at Ezra Church, a Union picket shouted across the lines to a Confederate with that friendly chaff command to both armies, I say, Johnny, how many of you are there left? To which the undaunted Confederate replied, About enough for another killing. On this terrible afternoon at Franklin, Hood's army suffered the last killing it was able to endure. He admitted in his dispatch to Richmond a loss of about 4,500. But Thomas, in his careful report, foots the Confederate loss at 6,252, of which all but 700 were killed and wounded. Schofield's loss was very much less, amounting to 2,326 in all, of which Wagner's unfortunate division lost 1,200. Had it not been for the mistake made in those two advanced brigades, Schofield's army would have slaughtered Hood at its leisure. Thomas, in his grave and sober manner, thus sums up the result of this signal victory. It not only seriously checked the enemy's advance, and gave General Schofield time to move his troops and all his property to Nashville, but it also caused deep depression among the men of Hood's army, making them doubly cautious in their subsequent movements. Schofield reported the day's work to Thomas, 
and by his advice and direction fell back during the night to Nashville. His retreat was entirely unmolested. For Wilson, while the battle was going on at Franklin, had met and checked Forrest, holding him at the river and driving some of his detachments back. Schofield's army, on arriving at Nashville, occupied a position selected for it in advance by General Thomas. General Schofield held the left extending to the Nolensville Pike. The Fourth Corps, under the command of General Wood, held the center, and the Sixteenth Corps, under General A. J. Smith, who had just arrived in time to assist in the defense of Tennessee, occupied the right, his flank resting on the Cumberland River below the city. Wilson, with his cavalry, was stationed first at Schofield's left, but Steedman's provisional command having arrived at Nashville on the evening of the 1st of December, Wilson was moved to the north side of the river, and Steedman occupied the space from Schofield's left to the Cumberland. Hood, as if driven by his evil genius, followed rapidly after Schofield and sat down before Nashville. He was aware, he said, of the reinforcements which had reached Thomas, and which had brought the strength of the National Army above his own, but he was in the position of a desperate gamester who had so little to lose that he feels it better policy to stake all than to leave the game. He knew that Mr. Davis was urgent in his orders for the reinforcement of the Army of Tennessee from Texas. He hoped that with this expected accession he might still realize the roseate dreams with which he had started out on this ill-starred campaign. He trusted to the chapter of accidents to give him some dazzling successes which would draw the Tennesseans and Kentuckians to his standard. He formed his line of battle in front of Nashville on the 2nd of December. Lee's corps took the center, astride the Franklin Pike, Stuart occupied the left, and Cheatham the right, their flanks widely extending toward the Cumberland River, and Forrest's cavalry filling the gap. But no sooner had he established himself there than, as if determined to give himself no chance in the impending battle, he detached Forrest on the 5th with W. B. Bates' division of infantry to invest and capture, if possible, the garrison of Murfreesboro, commanded by General Rousseau. This expedition totally failed. A sally was made on the 7th by some of Rousseau's troops under General Milroy, who won that day a merited consolation for his disaster at Winchester, and inflicted a sharp defeat upon Bates' infantry, which was thereupon recalled to Nashville. While Forrest, in this useless adventure, remained away from Hood too far to be recalled when he was most needed. While General Hood was strengthening his entrenchments and waiting in vain for good news from Forrest, and the arrival of reinforcements from across the Mississippi, which were never to come, Thomas, upon his side, was completing in his unhurried and patient manner his preparations for a crushing blow. He would have been ready to strike in about a week after Hood's arrival. Nothing exhibits more vividly the tension of spirit which had come with four years of terrible war than the fact that the administration at Washington, which had patiently allowed McClellan to sit motionless in front of Johnston from July to February, began to urge Thomas to move against Hood within twenty-four hours of the victory at Franklin. General Grant felt and exhibited this impatience in a much stronger degree. He not only sent out daily messages urging immediate action, but betrayed an irritation which reads strangely in the light of Thomas's career. He carried this feeling much further than the civil authorities at Washington, though it is true that Mr. Stanton, in a strain of whimsical exaggeration, wrote to Grant on the 7th of December. If he, Thomas, waits for Wilson to get ready, Gabriel will be blowing his last horn. Grant the next day telegraphed to Halleck, If Thomas has not struck yet, he ought to be ordered to hand over his command to Schofield. Halleck replied, showing that the government at Washington impatient as they felt for immediate action, cherished a higher regard for Thomas than that felt by the general-in-chief. If you wish General Thomas relieved, he said, give the order. No one here will, I think, interfere. The responsibility, however, will be yours, as no one here, so far as I am informed, wishes General Thomas removed. This dispatch saved General Thomas his command for a few days longer, but Grant refused to be placated. Thomas telegraphed him on the 8th in extenuation of his not having attacked Hood that he could not concentrate his troops and get their transportation in order in shorter time than it had been done. 
Halleck answered, expressing the deep dissatisfaction of Grant at Thomas's delay, and Grant, on the ninth, with growing indignation, requested Halleck to telegraph orders relieving Thomas at once and placing Schofield in command. These orders were immediately written out, but before they were transmitted to Nashville, Thomas reported in his usual manly and reasonable style, I regret that General Grant should feel dissatisfaction at my delay in attacking the enemy. I feel conscious that I have done everything in my power to prepare, and that the troops could not have been gotten ready before this. And if he should order me to be relieved, I will submit without a murmur. A terrible storm of freezing rain has come on since daylight, which will render an attack impossible till it breaks. On the receipt of this dispatch, the authorities took the responsibility of delaying the order for Thomas's relief until Grant could be consulted, and he, the same evening, suspended the order until, as he said, it is seen whether he will do anything. The spell of bad weather, announced by Thomas in this dispatch, continued for six days. It made any movement of either army impracticable. The rain froze as it fell, covering road and field with a thick coating of ice, upon which it was impossible for men to march, and on which every effort to move cavalry resulted in serious casualties to men and horses. General Grant knew this, but his fear that Hood might elude Thomas and lead him in a race to the Ohio River became so overpowering that it clouded his better judgment, and his dispatches of censure and vehement command came raining in day by day upon Thomas, causing that most subordinate and conscientious of soldiers exquisite pain, but never for an instant disturbing the calm equipoise of his mind. He replied from day to day, acknowledging the receipt of orders and promising to execute them at the earliest moment possible. The whole country, he said on the 11th, is covered with a perfect sheet of ice and sleet, and it is with difficulty that troops are able to move about on level ground. On the 12th it was no better. He again described in a dispatch the utter impossibility of moving men or horses, and his belief that an attack at this time would only result in a useless sacrifice of life. It is hard to believe, and painful to write, that after the receipt of this truthful and loyal statement, General Grant dispatched General John A. Logan, who was then visiting him at City Point, to relieve General Thomas at Nashville. He directed him, however, not to deliver the order or publish it until he reached his destination, and then, if Thomas had moved, not to deliver it at all. Even after Logan had started, Grant's uneasiness at the situation so gained upon him that he himself started for Nashville, and was met at Washington by news which electrified the country, saved General Thomas his command, and established him immutably in the respect and affection of his country. Thomas nowhere appears to greater advantage, not even on the hills of Chickamauga opposing his indomitable spirit on the surging tide of disaster and defeat, than he does during this week, opposing his sense of duty to the will of his omnipotent superior, and refusing to move one hour before he thought the interests of the country permitted it, even under the threat of removal and disgrace. In answer to Halleck's last peremptory dispatch, he replied on the evening of the 14th of December, The ice having melted away today, the enemy will be attacked tomorrow morning. And the next night, he sent this laconic dispatch. Attacked enemies left this morning, drove it from the river below city very nearly to Franklin Pike, distance about eight miles. The frightful storms of rain and sleet which had held Thomas as if spellbound had interfered equally with the mobility of Hood. Neither one nor the other could stir. Still, without the slightest trepidation, the Confederate chief waited for Thomas's attack, feeling sure, as he says in his report, that I could defeat him and thus gain possession of Nashville with abundant supplies for the army. This would give me possession of Tennessee. So late as the 11th of December, he wrote in a most encouraging strain to the Confederate Secretary of War, making suggestions as to his spring campaign, and saying with unconscious humor, I think the position of this army is now such as to force the enemy to take the initiative. On the morning of the 15th of December, in the midst of a heavy fog which masked the movements of Thomas's army, he threw it forward to the long-desired attack. It was the sort of weather which from time immemorial 
had been held as a justification for absolute inaction. The warm rains had changed the sleety roads and fields to a sea of mire, through which the troops floundered painfully. To divert Hood's attention from his real purpose, Thomas had ordered Steedman to demonstrate heavily with his command against the Confederate right, east of the Nolensville Pike, orders which that energetic commander carried out with such tumultuous zeal as to draw Hood's attention almost entirely to that side of the field. Wilson's cavalry and Smith's infantry corps then moved out along the Hardin Pike and commenced the grand movement of the day by wheeling to the left and advancing against the left flank of Hood's position. Wilson first struck the enemy along Richland Creek, which bounds the city on the west, and drove him rapidly, making numerous captures, until he came upon a detached redoubt intended as a protection to Hood's left flank, which was carried in splendid style by a portion of Edward Hatch's dismounted troopers. Another work and some hundreds of prisoners were immediately after captured by the combined assault of Smith's and Wilson's men. But finding that Smith had not gone as far to the right as he had hoped, Thomas directed Schofield to move the 23rd Corps to the right of General Smith, by this means enabling the cavalry to act more freely upon Hood's left flank and rear. Schofield's two divisions, admirably commanded by Generals Couch and Cox, marched with great spirit and swiftness to the position assigned them and gained ground rapidly all the afternoon. The 4th Corps, under General T. J. Wood, which held the center of the Union line, assaulted about one o'clock Hood's advanced position at Montgomery Hill, a gallant feat of arms executed by the brigade of Colonel P. Sidney Post. From this point a rapid advance was made, the whole line working steadily forward until Hood was driven everywhere from his position and forced back to a new line, having its right and left flank respectively on the Overton and the Brentwood Hills his left occupying a commanding range of hills on the east of the Franklin Pike. His center stretched across from that road to another a mile to the west called the Granny White Turnpike. Both flanks were refused and strongly entrenched to the east and west and to the south, while the main line fronted northward. The Union lines closed rapidly about him, and in this position both sides waited for the morning. The events of the day had filled the Union Army with confidence and enthusiasm, and at early dawn, on the morning of the 16th, Thomas sent his whole line forward. Wood pressed the Confederate skirmishers across the Franklin Pike, and swinging a little to the right, advanced due south, driving the enemy before him, until he came upon his new main line of works, constructed during the night on Overton's Hill. Steedman marched out on the Nolensville Pike and formed on the left of Wood, the latter general taking command of both corps. Smith connected with Wood's right, his corps facing southward, while Schofield began the morning's work in the position where Knight had overtaken him, his line running almost due southward and perpendicular to that of Wood. Thomas now rode along the entire line, surveying every inch of the field, and at last gave orders that the movement should continue against the Confederate left. His entire line was closely crowding that of Hood, there being only a space of six hundred yards between them. At about three o'clock, Post's brigade, which had on the day before so gallantly carried Montgomery Hill, was ordered by General Wood to assault the works on the Overton Heights. C. R. Thompson's brigade of colored troops of Steedman's command joined in this desperate enterprise. Our men, says Thomas, moved steadily onward up the hill until near the crest, when the reserve of the enemy rose and poured into the assaulting column a most destructive fire, causing the men first to waver and then to fall back, leaving their dead and wounded, black and white indiscriminately mingled, lying amidst the abatis, the gallant Colonel Post among the wounded. This was the only Confederate success of the day, but it was enough to excite the wildest hopes in the always sanguine breast of General Hood. Sitting on his horse and observing the repulse of Post's storming party, he says, I had matured the movement for the next morning. The enemy's right flank, by this hour, stood in air some six miles from Nashville, and I had determined to withdraw my entire force during the night and attack this exposed flank in rear, still intent on his reverent imitation of Stonewall Jackson. But even at the moment he was maturing this strategic scheme, his line, he says, broke at all points, 
and he beheld for the first and only time a Confederate army abandon the field in confusion. Immediately after Post's assault had failed, the commands of Smith and Schofield advanced to the work assigned them, and with marvelous celerity and success they burst over the enemy's works in every direction, carrying all before them, irreparably breaking his lines in a dozen places, and capturing all his artillery and thousands of prisoners. The result was so sudden and so overwhelming that neither side was quite prepared for it. Wilson had been making rapid progress with his cavalry on the extreme right, and had come to report his success to Thomas, who stood with Schofield directing operations. He saw the rush for the Confederate position, and galloped back to his command to share in the final struggle. But as Cox says, before he could get halfway there, the whole Confederate line was crushed in like an eggshell. The arch was broken. There were no reserves to restore it and from the right and left the Confederate troops peeled away from the works in wild confusion. With the exception of the casualties in the gallant rush made by Post's and Thompson's brigades, Thomas's entire loss was but slight. The Confederates abandoned their artillery, rushed across the granny white road to the Franklin Pike, and poured in a disorganized mass down the only avenue to the south which was left open to them. No route during the war was ever more complete. Thomas captured in the two days 4,462 prisoners, including 287 officers of all grades from that of Major General, 53 pieces of artillery, and thousands of small arms. One or two of the brigades that still retained their organization formed as a rear guard on the Franklin Pike, under the command of S.D. Lee, and during the first hours of the night efficiently maintained a certain show of resistance to the pursuing cavalry. Night quickly closed in, and a drenching rain came down which made pursuit extremely difficult. General Grant was never satisfied with the swiftness and efficiency of Thomas's pursuit of Hood's beaten army. Yet with the exception of that historic chase which began at Petersburg and ended at Appomattox, there was no other pursuit of a beaten army during the war so energetic, so prolonged, and so fruitful. The cavalry column came up with the enemy's rear guard four miles north of Franklin. They charged it in front and flank, capturing 413 prisoners and three colors. They drove the Confederates through Franklin, capturing 2,000 wounded in the hospitals there, and liberated some hundreds of Union prisoners. The cavalry pressed on, followed by the infantry, who moved with such expedition as was possible over the frightful roads encumbered by all the debris of two armies. On the 18th, the enemy crossed Harpeth River, destroying the bridges behind them. The profuse rains of the month now began to show their effects in the swollen watercourses. At Rutherford's Creek they found the stream, which was usually a rivulet, a foaming torrent. It took two days to get the command across. Material for a bridge over Duck River was hastily pushed forward to that point, so that Wood crossed late on the 22nd, and got into position on the Pulaski Road. Hood's army, though still retreating at the top of their speed, had by this time gained the powerful assistance of Forrest, who had joined them at Columbia, and Hood had formed a strong rear guard of 4,000 infantry under E. C. Walthall, Lee having been wounded on the 17th, and all his available cavalry. With the exception of his rear guard, says Thomas, his army has become a disheartened and disorganized rabble of half-armed and barefooted men, who sought every opportunity to fall out by the wayside and desert their cause to put an end to their sufferings. On Christmas morning, Thomas, still continuing the pursuit, drove the enemy out of Pulaski and chased him toward Lamb's Ferry over roads which had become almost impassable and through a country devoid of sustenance for man and beast. The Confederates were, however, more fleet than their pursuers. The swollen rivers and other accidents everywhere favored them, and during the 26th and 27th Hood crossed the Tennessee River. Even here he did not feel in safety, but continued his headlong retreat to Tupelo, Mississippi. From there, on the 13th of January, he sent a dispatch to the Confederate War Department requesting to be relieved from the command of the army. After consultation with General Beauregard, he issued furloughs to most of his Tennessee troops. His army, what there was of it, rapidly melted away. Four thousand of them went to join Maury at Mobile. It is hard to say what became of the rest. 
after the pressure of public opinion had forced the richmond authorities to the bitter necessity of reappointing general johnston to the command of that spectral army which was expected to oppose the triumphal march of sherman to the north the three corps of hood's army which reported to him consisted of two thousand men under c l stevenson s d lee's successor two thousand under cheatham and one thousand under stuart in addition to these there were he says little parties who gradually made their way into north carolina as groups and individuals and were brought to him at last by general s d lee the pursuit of hood's retreating army was not continued longer by thomas on the twenty ninth of december a small force of cavalry of only six hundred men under command of colonel w j palmer of the fifteenth pennsylvania went roving through north alabama and mississippi striking the enemy here and there destroying one day his pontoon trains on another day a large supply train sabering and shooting his mules attacking the confederate general w w russell near thorn hill routing him capturing some prisoners burning some wagons and then proceeding at his leisure back to camp at decatur after a march of over two hundred fifty miles reporting a loss of one killed and two wounded mr davis promptly complied with hood's request for relief and he bade farewell on the twenty third of january eighteen sixty five to what was left of the army of fifty thousand men which johnston had led with such unfailing prudence and wisdom from tunnel hill to atlanta and which hood had dashed to pieces against the national breastworks on every field from atlanta to nashville hood then visited virginia was kindly received by jefferson davis with whom he always remained a favorite even amid the impending ruin of the confederacy and was on his way to texas with instructions to bring a new army from that remote but gallant state to the rescue of the fallen cause when he heard of lee's surrender he tried for many days to cross the mississippi several times as he says hotly chased by federal cavalry through the wood and cane brakes but at last making a virtue of necessity he surrendered to general john w davidson at natchez on the thirty first of may end of chapter one chapter two of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay the albemarle the successive captures and recaptures of the town of plymouth in north carolina were episodes of the war so unimportant that they would scarcely claim a place in history were it not for the memorable naval fights in the spring of eighteen sixty four in which the confederate ironclad albemarle gained great distinction and the splendid heroism of a young sailor by which in the autumn of the same year she was destroyed this famous vessel was slowly and painfully constructed far inland in a cornfield on the banks of the roanoke river about thirty miles below weldon the same officer who had changed the merrimac into the ironclad virginia used the experience acquired in that service in the building of the albemarle nearly everything requisite in shipbuilding was lacking but in spite of all difficulties the vessel was built at last and slid from the bluff into the river without springing a leak she measured one hundred and fifty-two feet in length forty-five in width and with her armor on drew eight feet in general construction she resembled all the other confederate ironclads her casement or shield was sixty feet long sloping to the deck at an angle of forty-five degrees plated with two courses of two-inch iron rolled at the tredgegar works she was armed with two rifled brook guns mounted on pivot carriages so disposed that each gun commanded three portholes her beak was of oak plated with two-inch iron she was a year under construction 
rumours of her progress occasionally transpired and the brave and vigilant commander c w flusser to whom her first sortie was to be mortal warned the department in the summer of eighteen sixty three that a formidable craft was in preparation in the river it would have required no considerable expedition to destroy her in the yard but general grant's attention was at that time fully occupied with other matters she was not completed until april eighteen sixty four and her first service under her captain j w cook was to assist general hoke in an attack upon the town of plymouth which was held by a small union force under general h w wessels hoke's division marched down and surrounded the place his two flanks resting on the river above and below the town it was the task of the albemarle to clear away the navy from the river front the attack began on the eighteenth of april and lasted all day with no advantage to the confederates wessel's troops and the two gunboats miami and southfield under the intelligent direction of flusser repulsing every attempt to take the place but on the next day the intervention of the albemarle put a different face on the affair she dropped down the river in front of the town by night the fire of the fort rattling harmlessly against her shield flusser warned of her coming made ready for action and steamed up to meet her with the miami and the southfield chained together the adversaries met in the first glimmer of dawn the ram struck the miami a slight blow and passing on with one thrust of her beak tore open the side of the southfield which filled and sank almost immediately the miami opened upon the ram with her batteries with results fatal only to her own brave commander flusser who was personally firing the first shots was struck by a fragment of a dahlgren shell rebounding from the iron side of the ram and instantly killed his successor in command seeing that if he remained he would simply be sacrificing his vessel uselessly retired down the river to albemarle sound the post of plymouth surrounded on every side fell into the hands of the confederates the destruction of the albemarle was thenceforward the principal object of the naval squadron in the sound captain melancton smith an able and experienced officer was dispatched to the scene of action for that especial service he rapidly made the necessary arrangements for attack his main reliance was upon his guns and torpedoes ramming was to be resorted to in the discretion of commanders though the peculiar construction of the double enders of which his fleet consisted rendered this a doubtful expedient the albemarle did not wait to be attacked but sallied forth at midday of the fifth of may with the intention of clearing both albemarle and pamlico sounds of the union fleet and if possible regaining control of hatteras inlet she was attended by the transport cotton plant and the captured store-ship bombshell smith speedily got his vessels under way the flagship matabeset leading the sassacus and the rest of the fleet following eight vessels in all carrying thirty-two guns besides twenty-three howitzers against this heavy armament the undaunted ironclad came on with her two guns and so enormous is the power of invulnerability that the fight was not altogether unequal we feel in reading the epics and sagas of the past that achilles and siegfried are safe no matter what the number of their adversaries unless the exposed heel or the mark of the linden leaf is touched without the ironclads in mobile bay all the valor of farragut would have been of no avail against the tough sides of the tennessee the cotton plant was at once ordered back out of danger and the bombshell at the first onset of the union fleet surrendered but the albemarle held her own sturdily 
her two pivot guns working in safety and at leisure seemed to quadruple themselves by dint of efficiency the battle began at a quarter before five o'clock the albemarle fired two damaging shots into the matabeset and then tried to ram her but the swifter ship evaded the blow and poured a broadside upon the ironclad the sassacus coming up did the same and the other vessels in succession did what they could their principal danger was firing into or fouling each other their fire was by no means ineffective the boats of the albemarle were shot away her smoke stack so injured that it almost ceased to draw many of her plates were started and shattered and her after gun was broken and disabled but to the eyes of the officers in the union fleet this concentrated fire appeared to have no more effect on the ironsides of the monster than so much thistle down lieutenant commander f a Rowe of the sassacus therefore resolved to try the desperate expedient of ramming the ironclad he drew off to a distance of some two hundred yards and putting on a full head of steam rushed upon the albemarle at a speed of ten knots an hour he struck her just abaft the casemate on the starboard side with a shock which caused every timber to groan though nothing gave way there was a moment of consternation on board the ram but seeing they did not sink the crew immediately rallied to their guns and continued the fight the sassacus steamed heavily hoping to force the ram under water and in this row might have met the success his bravery deserved but for a shot from the albemarle which passed through his boiler and in an instant filled his vessel with scalding steam disabling his engine and sixteen men crippled as he was his engine room inaccessible the vessel filled with smoke and steam and the shrieks of scalded sailors Rowe still fought his guns with imperturbable gallantry hurling upon the albemarle his hundred-pound shot which rebounded in pieces on his own deck he slowly dropped out of the fight and a period of considerable confusion ensued as the result of two mistakes the flag of the albemarle being shot away it was thought she had surrendered and the while loosing erroneously reported herself as sinking this caused a temporary cessation of the battle which was not renewed with much energy until night closed in the albemarle whose riddled smokestack refused to draw was able by burning the lard and bacon on board to steam back to plymouth she had gained great glory throughout the confederacy by her two battles and captain cook was promoted to the command of the rebel navy on the coast of north carolina with a few knots more speed she could have destroyed the whole union fleet as it was the capture of a fort with a brigade of prisoners the destruction of a gunboat and a drawn battle lasting a full afternoon with a squadron mounting fifty-five pieces were no inconsiderable claims to renown she came out of the roanoke but once after this battle on the twenty fourth of may she was seen by a picket boat apparently dragging four torpedoes a single shot fired at her caused her to retire up the stream she lay at her berth by the wharf at plymouth until the twenty seventh of october when her name was associated for ever with one still more glorious of course the navy department could not count upon this long inaction and so long as the albemarle lay substantially unhurt at plymouth she was a source of constant anxiety to the squadron in the sound they had no ironclads of sufficiently light draught to cross the bar at hatteras inlet several were in course of construction but it was not safe to wait for their completion a party of volunteers from the why all loosing was sent to destroy the ram with torpedoes late in may but an untoward accident the fouling of their line by a schooner prevented a success which was merited by their courage and good conduct september had come before the plan and the men were found that were adapted to the work 
the scheme was to fit out two small steam launches rigged with spar torpedoes and armed with howitzers which should try to reach the ram at night by surprise the man was lieutenant william b cushing who had attracted the attention of his superiors by several noteworthy examples of coolness and daring once he had landed by night with two boat crews at the town of smithville being rowed under the very guns of fort caswell walked with three men to general lewis haybert's headquarters captured an officer of engineers the general himself being absent in wilmington and had come safely away with his prisoner from a post garrisoned by a thousand men at another time having volunteered to destroy the ironclad raleigh supposed to be lying in the cape fear river he went in his cutter up the stream eluding the sentries on either shore landed within seven miles of wilmington thoroughly reconnoitred the place found the raleigh a total wreck and after three days of adventures in which his luck and daring were equally amazing he was intercepted on his return down the river in the moonlight by a whole fleet of guard boats and his escape apparently cut off turning about he found himself confronted by a schooner filled with troops instead of surrendering he dashed for new inlet and seconded by his crew who always seemed when with him as insensible to danger as himself he escaped into the breakers where the enemy dared not follow and safely rejoined his ship his perfect coolness in critical emergencies was a matter of temperament rather than calculation he prepared everything in advance with a care and judgment remarkable in one so young but when the time of action came the immediate peril of death was nothing more than a gentle stimulant to him he enjoyed it as he would a frolic he was a handsome youth twenty-one years of age six feet high with a beardless face and bright autumn hair after conferences with admiral lee and mr fox the assistant secretary of the navy cushing went to new york and found two launches at the brooklyn navy yard suited to his purpose they were forty six feet in length nine and a half feet wide and drew about forty inches while they were being equipped for the work by engineer-in-chief w w wood of the navy cushing visited his mother in fredonia new york and confided to her his intention saying he needed her prayers returning to new york he took his launches out and tested his torpedoes and then started them southward by way of chesapeake bay one of them on the way was attacked by guerrillas and burned at hampton roads cushing refitted his only remaining boat and passing through the dismal swamp came to roanoke island there he gave out that he was bound for beaufort and steamed away by night to join the fleet which was lying off the mouth of the roanoke river the senior officer being commander w h mccomb whose flagship was the shamrock here for the first time cushing disclosed to his officers and men the purpose of his expedition leaving them free to go or stay as they preferred all wanted to go with him several others volunteered among them paymaster francis h swan whose anxiety for a fight was paid by a severe wound and four months in libby prison w a howarth cushing's tried and trusted companion in former adventures and two other masters mates thomas s gay and john woodman two engineer officers stever and stotesbury and eight men a cutter from the shamrock was taken in tow with eleven men their duty was to board the wreck of the southfield if the guard which was known to be posted there should discover the party as they passed a false start was made on the night of the twenty sixth the boat ran aground and so much time was wasted in getting her off that the expedition was postponed for twenty-four hours at midnight in rain and storm the devoted little party set forth fortune favoured them at first they passed the wreck of the southfield without a hail and came in view of the few lights of plymouth the little noise made by the low pressure engines was muffled with tarpaulins which also concealed every ray of light from the launch cushing stood near the bow connected by lines with every part of the boat as the brain is by nerves with every limb he held a line by which he was to detach the torpedo from the spar which carried it when it should have been shoved under the overhang of the ram 
another by which he was to explode it after it had floated up to a point of contact and two more one attached to the wrist and one to the ankle of the engineer by which he directed the movements of the boat he had two complete plans in his mind one was to use his own nervous phrase to take the albemarle alive by landing some distance below stealing up and dashing on her from the wharf but just as he was shearing in close to the lower wharf he heard a dog bark a sentry hail and a moment afterwards a shot was fired instantly dismissing his first plan cushing ordered the cutter to cast loose and row to capture the southfield's picket and then putting on all steam he rushed for the ram whose black bulk loomed in the darkness before him by the light of a fire on the wharf he discovered that she was surrounded by a boom of logs extending all around her for the express purpose of protecting her against torpedoes a brisk fire opened on the launch from the ship and the shore but his keen intelligence was only sharpened by the danger and he saw at a glance that on the course he was taking he could not get over the boom he therefore sheered off a hundred yards and then turning came at full speed to strike the logs at right angles hoping thus to slide over them and getting inside the sort of pen they formed to reach the ram the fire had by this time become severe swan was wounded cushing's clothes were torn by three bullets the sole of his shoe was carried away but he was unhurt and very happy being hailed again as he dashed forward he shouted leave the ram we are going to blow you up a response as considerate as it proved truthful his crew catching the infection also chaffed the confederates while cushing not wishing to let the enemy do all the firing sent a charge of canister among them at short range which he said served to moderate their zeal and disturb their aim the launch touched the logs and slid gently over them the spar was lowered cushing as cool in that shower of deadly missiles and in face of a hundred pound rifle whose muzzle he could now plainly see as a skilled artisan at his bench watched for the proper instant detached the torpedo with a line held in his right hand waited a moment for it to rise under the hull of the ram and then pulled with the left hand which had just been cut by a bullet at the same instant the hundred pounder was fired the grape shot at ten feet range came roaring over cushing and his crew just missing them but the torpedo had done its work and a suffocating mass of water rose from the side of the albemarle and fell upon the launch half filling it and drenching the crew cushing who thought his boat had been pierced by the shot from the ram saw there was no hope of saving her being summoned to surrender he refused and ordered his crew to save themselves he threw off his sword revolver coat and shoes and jumped into the water the albemarle's commander did not at first realize what had happened he heard a dull report as of an unshotted gun a fragment of wood fell at his feet he sent a carpenter to examine the hull who reported a hole big enough to drive a wagon in the albemarle was resting in the mud she had sunk so little her own officers did not perceive it and the victors were unconscious of their success the men in the launch were captured all but three who had followed cushing in his desperate leap into the icy river two of these were drowned the third got ashore and was saved perhaps no event of his life gave such proof of cushing's extraordinary nerve and endurance as his escape he swam out in the darkness knowing there was no shelter for him but the fleet twelve miles away he evaded the rebel boats which were rowing about the river until he was well out of sight nearing the shore he found woodman drowning and kept him up ten minutes with his own fast failing strength but could not bring him to land cushing at last managed to reach the muddy shore and fell half in and half out of the water there he lay until daybreak unable to move when the dawn came he found himself lying on the edge of a swamp in full view of a sentry not forty steps from a fort when the sun had warmed his chilled limbs a little he attempted to crawl away from his exposed position and being covered with mud he succeeded by sliding on his back inch by inch though soldiers were several times almost near enough to tread on him 
after gaining the swamp he wandered for several hours among the cypresses scratched and torn at every step by thorns and briars at last he found an aged negro and the disposition he made of him is noteworthy instead of employing him to assist in his escape cushing plied him with greenbacks and texts of scripture until he induced him to go into plymouth and get news of the last night's affair the tidings he brought back were such a cordial to the forlorn victor that he plunged into the swamp with new heart and hope in the afternoon he came upon a stream where there was a picket post of soldiers who had a small skiff fastened to a cypress root in the water watching them till they sat down to eat he swam to the boat noiselessly unfastened it and drew it around a bend in the river then got in and paddled for life and liberty he floated on through twilight to darkness out of the roanoke into the broad sound the night was providentially still and calm he steered by the stars till he reached the picket vessel valley city he had strength enough left to give a feeble hail then fell with a splash into the water in the bottom of his boat he had paddled he says every minute for ten successive hours and for four my body had been asleep with the exception of my two arms and brain at first they took the skiff for a torpedo boat and were more inclined to give him a volley of musketry than to pick him up but he soon established his identity refreshed himself and went to report to the flagship where he was received as one risen from the dead with salutes of rejoicing the night air became gay with rockets and all hands were called to cheer ship perhaps the most remarkable words in the simple narrative this heroic youth has left of his strange adventure are these with which it closes in the morning i was again well in every way with the exception of hands and feet and had the pleasure of exchanging shots with the batteries that i had inspected on the day previous on the thirtieth of october commander macomb having ascertained that the direct channel was obstructed passed into the roanoke above plymouth by middle river and thus took the place in reverse a spirited engagement between the fleet and the forts began about eleven in the morning of the thirty first a fortunate shot from the shamrock exploded the enemy's magazine and the confederates hastily evacuated their works the victorious sailors rowing ashore captured the rear guard with twenty-two cannon and a large quantity of stores end of chapter two chapter three of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter three fort fisher and wilmington the ports of wilmington and savannah after the capture of new orleans and the strict blockade of charleston and especially after the occupation of mobile bay became the most important and valuable means of communication with the outside world which were left to the confederacy in spite of the utmost efforts of the national vessels an extensive trade was carried on between these ports and those west indian islands which had been taken as points of transshipment for the contraband goods exported from england to the confederacy and for the cotton which formed the only coin by which the south paid its debts to europe there was a peculiarity about the harbour of wilmington which rendered it the favourite port of entry for blockade runners the city stands on the cape fear river about twenty-eight miles from the sea there is a good entrance to the river at its mouth and another by new inlet six miles in a straight line to the north the space between them merely sand and shallow water is called smith's island the southern extremity of which is the sharp headland of cape fear beyond which stretch the frying-pan shoals for ten miles the southern entrance was protected by fort caswell the northern by fort fisher between the two on the mainland was the village of smithville 
where the blockaders lay in wait watching their chance to dart out to sea by one or the other sally port those wishing to enter would wait outside till evening fell and then dash in through the blockading fleet to the safe shelter of the guns of one or the other fort legitimate trade had ceased immediately on the proclamation of the blockade by the president but the necessities of the confederacy in the hope of enormous profits by enterprising english adventurers formed together so powerful a stimulus to blockade running that as a matter of course it at once assumed a considerable development and for a time actually increased in proportion to the means taken to suppress it the confederates had little use for their cotton except as a medium of exchange it therefore fell to a lower price than usual in the south while the dearth of it in england and in the north caused an enormous increase in its value in those countries the difference between eight cents a pound at which it could be purchased in wilmington and two shillings at which it could be sold in liverpool afforded a profit which would compensate for almost any possible risk three successful voyages would pay for a vessel and the odds against a blockade runner were nothing like so great as that a single ship the r e lee ran the blockade twenty-one times between december eighteen sixty two and november eighteen sixty three carrying abroad six thousand bales of cotton this was a case of extraordinary success but it was the opinion of our naval officers that two-thirds of the vessels attempting to enter wilmington during the first half of eighteen sixty four were successful it is true that sixty steamers running the blockade were captured or destroyed by the squadron before wilmington but in many cases these had more than paid for themselves before their fate overtook them and yet the blockade was one of the most effective ever seen in war captures to the amount of many millions of dollars were made and the shore was strewn with the wrecks of ships which were destroyed in the attempt to escape in the latter part of eighteen sixty four the blockade was greatly increased in stringency three cordons of ships were drawn about the blockaded ports the first as close as it could lie to the shore and the third one hundred and thirty miles from land even through all these toils the long narrow and swift steel cruisers sometimes made their way but the proportion of those which were captured grew so large that the industry languished the most prudent had retired with their gains and the business was no longer what it had been the government of the united states might have been satisfied with the results of the blockade but for its tremendous expense to watch the port of wilmington required a vast armada and it was for this reason fully as much as to put a stop to contraband trade that the navy department and the president constantly urged upon the military authorities a joint expedition of the army and navy against fort fisher mr wells had from time to time during the war tried to effect this purpose but it was not until the autumn of eighteen sixty four that he could get the promise of a military force to assist the naval attack he at once took measures to make ready as great a force as possible and offered the command of it to admiral farragut his health which had been seriously impaired by his incessant exertions and exposures in the gulf compelled that energetic officer to decline this appointment he was then given to rear admiral d d porter who had greatly distinguished himself by his zeal and ability in command of the mississippi squadron a fleet of naval vessels says mr wells surpassing in numbers and equipments any which had assembled during the war was collected with dispatch at hampton roads general grant promised an expeditionary force of over six thousand men it was the wish of the president and the war department that general gillmore should have command of these troops but that brave and capable officer had fallen under general grant's displeasure and he had substituted general godfrey weitzel 
being informed of the plan proposed weitzel went down to new inlet in the last days of september and with the assistance of rear admiral s p lee made a thorough reconnaissance of the place he found fort fisher a most formidable work the confederates had made the best use of the long leisure afforded them and had built an imposing fortress on the narrow sand spit which runs northward from new inlet between cape fear river and the sea a small outwork called fort buchanan was built on the shore of the inlet a half mile to the north fort fisher stretched all the way across the narrow peninsula at that point only about five hundred yards wide the land face looked north the sea face east running along the beach for thirteen hundred yards the northern front mounted twenty-one guns and three mortars the sea front twenty-four the work was so extensive that if it had consisted of its vast parapet alone it would have protected only those immediately under the wall they had therefore built an extraordinary series of traverses made bomb-proof so that fort fisher really consisted of something like a dozen small forts in one enclosure weitzel returned and reported the result of his observations to grant who told him he did not think he would start the expedition that the navy had advertised it too widely by rendezvousing the fleet at hampton roads a charge which seems hardly reasonable as the fleet could not sail without a rendezvous the plan lay in abeyance for several weeks it was taken up with renewed spirit on account of an idea conceived by general butler suggested by reading of the great destruction consequent upon an explosion of gunpowder at erith england he supposed that firing a large mass of powder some four hundred yards from fort fisher would for the moment paralyze the garrison and so injure the work as to render its capture easy this plan after it had been tried and failed seemed very ridiculous and every one concerned in the affair except butler made haste to disavow all responsibility for it but no one thought it ridiculous when it was suggested general butler says it was readily embraced by the secretary of the navy and with more caution by the president after a thorough study of the subject by accomplished officers of the army and navy it was decided that the experiment was worth trying the louisiana a boat of little value was selected and fitted out and loaded with two hundred and thirty five tons of powder it was then the first week in december sherman was approaching savannah and general grant in view of the weakening of the garrison of wilmington by the detachment of troops to meet the victors of atlanta was anxious for the expedition to be off he afterwards said that he had never dreamed of general butler's going with it that he had given his orders to weitzel through butler his department commander as required by military courtesy without any thought of his going in person butler contradicted this statement insisting that his purpose was known to grant from the beginning however this may be the expedition started under the worst possible auspices weitzel who had been selected to command it never read his orders which had been communicated by grant to butler and not shown to weitzel in these orders grant had said the object of the expedition will be gained on effecting a landing on the mainland between cape fear river and the atlantic north of the north entrance to the river should such landing be effected whether the enemy hold fort fisher or the batteries guarding the entrance to the river there the troops should entrench themselves and by co-operating with the navy effect the reduction and capture of those places it was an oversight almost incredible that general butler did not say a word to weitzel of these clear and important instructions to make a bad matter worse neither butler nor weitzel was on good terms with admiral porter who was to command the fleet the history of this unfortunate expedition as written by the principal participators is little more than a series of mutual recriminations the fleet sailed from hampton roads on the thirteenth of december and the transports with six thousand five hundred troops on the next day from the lack of a good understanding so essential in such cases they did not arrive together at the rendezvous 
butler went at once to new inlet but admiral porter put in at beaufort to coal and receive ammunition as he says for now that the expedition had waited two months there was no particular hurry when the admiral was ready to go in and explode the powder-boat on the eighteenth butler suggested delay until the sea which had grown rough should subside a gale came on which lasted several days and which the fleet at anchor rode out in the most creditable manner when the storm abated porter again informed butler who in his turn had gone to beaufort for coal and water that the powder boat would be exploded on the night of the twenty third of december admiral porter seems up to this time to have expected a great effect from the explosion he suggested to butler that even at a distance of twenty five miles the explosion might affect the boilers of his steamers and in another letter he says the powder vessel is as complete as human ingenuity can make her she was towed to her place near the beach four hundred yards from the fort by the wilderness under the charge of two of the bravest and most accomplished officers of the navy captain alex c rind and lieutenant s w preston both of them volunteers every contingency was provided for it was even arranged between those two devoted sailors that if she were boarded by the enemy and in danger of capture preston at a signal given by rind was to stick a lighted candle into a bag of powder all this devotion however was to go for nothing there is even a touch of the comic about this daring deed of two of the most heroic men our navy has known they lighted their fuses and kindled a fire of pine knots in the cabin of the louisiana and then jumped into their boats and pulled for the wilderness the fuses were set for an hour and a half the wilderness steamed out to sea the whole fleet waited with breathless apprehension for the result the explosion took place at forty-five minutes past one there was a blaze on the horizon a dull detonation and nothing more there was little or no concussion felt on ship or shore it was general butler's opinion that the ignition was imperfect in fact that not more than one-tenth of the powder was burned at daylight the admiral got his fleet under way and stood in towards the fort in line of battle he attacked in fine style and soon silenced the guns of the fortress to all appearance though as it turned out little damage was done at evening general butler arrived with some of the transports but as it was too late to land the fleet retired to a safe anchorage the next day was christmas the transports were all on hand and under cover of the guns of the fleet which kept up an annoying fire all the morning the troops began to land about five miles north of the fort weitzel took the first five hundred as a reconnoitring party and pushed rapidly towards the fort capturing on the way the small garrison of an outlying earthwork on questioning the prisoners he found they belonged to hoke's division which he had left at richmond and that the rest of the brigade to which they belonged was a mile and a half to the rear this convinced him that the garrison of fort fisher had been newly strengthened and this impression was deepened by the fact that the next squad he captured said they were outside the fort because the bomb proofs were full this was not encouraging information but he pushed on advancing his skirmish line to within one hundred and fifty yards of the fort and from a knoll had a good view of the interior of the work what he saw powerfully impressed him the fort was practically uninjured and seemed to him with its thick parapets its bastions in high relief its bomb-proof traverses the strongest work he had seen during the war weitzel was a brave and intelligent soldier but he had been engaged in five assaults of entrenchments three times attacking twice defending the works on all five occasions the party attacking was repulsed and weitzel decided naturally enough that he would not advise an attack upon a work stronger than any he had ever attacked in vain or defended successfully weitzel reported to butler the result of his reconnaissance which was confirmed by general c b comstock of grant's staff who had also reconnoitred the work upon this report general butler 
made the capital mistake of the expedition grant's orders were clear and explicit the landing itself was to be regarded as a success if the work did not fall at once the troops were to stay there and entrench themselves and with the help of the navy reduce and capture the place general butler chose to assume that he had not effected a landing because all of his troops had not yet got ashore the weather began to look unfavorable he therefore resolved to abandon the enterprise and return to fort monroe even then he did not show his orders to weitzel who said afterwards that if he had known of their existence he would have advised differently while the generals afloat were coming to this unfortunate conclusion one of the officers ashore had made up his mind in the opposite sense general n m curtis a man of unusual physical strength courage and energy had pushed his advance almost to the parapet of the fort the fire of the navy had been so severe as to confine the garrison in great part to the bomb-proof so that curtis's men were hardly molested in their approach they came so near that they captured a mounted courier one man climbed the parapet and brought away a flag which had been shot away curtis was burning with eagerness to assault his men shared his enthusiasm of course it cannot be said whether he would have succeeded or not though his spirit so infected general comstock that he changed his mind and now believed the movement practicable but the orders were given to re-embark and slowly and reluctantly curtis drew away his men from the coveted prize that he believed was in his hands the re-embarkation of the two thousand five hundred who had landed took as much time as would have been required to put the whole force on shore the weather grew worse the next day and a portion of curtis's brigade remained on shore until the twenty seventh without molestation by the confederates on the evening of that day general butler arrived at fort monroe and sent a brief telegram to general grant announcing his return and the failure of the expedition on the third of january he made a more detailed report throwing the blame of the failure upon admiral porter saying that the first delay of three days of good weather was due to the navy not being on hand when the army arrived that the powder boat was prematurely exploded that porter should have run by the fort and thus blockaded wilmington that hoke's division was in front of him making the enemy's force greater than his own that the experience of port hudson and fort wagner convinced him that so strong a work as fisher could not be taken by assault upon this general grant made a merciless endorsement to the effect that he had never intended that butler should go with the expedition and that he was in error in stating that he came back in obedience to his instructions grant immediately relieved general butler from his command which closed his military career he was summoned before the committee on the conduct of the war a few days later and defended himself with his usual vigor and adroitness and the committee in their report after hearing grant and porter fully justified the action of butler the president was deeply disappointed by the untoward result of the expedition finding that admiral porter and the navy department were still confident that an attack if properly made would succeed without losing a moment of time in regrets and without even waiting for the official reports of the affair he directed that admiral porter should hold his position off fort fisher and that the secretary of the navy should send in his name a telegram to general grant inviting him to a renewed cooperation in attacking the fort to this grant instantly acceded he sent back the same force which had gone before adelbert ames's and charles j payne's divisions adding joseph c abbott's brigade of the twenty fourth corps and assigned to command the expedition general alfred h terry a landing was effected on the thirteenth of january in this case there was no room for doubt or vacillation the failure of butler was a sufficient education for terry he knew he was sent there to take the fort he proceeded with the greatest energy and singleness of purpose to do this his first work was to draw a strong line of contravallation across the narrow sand spit about two miles north of the fort to protect his rear against any attack from wilmington 
this was completed by a hard night's work at eight in the morning terry's foothold on the peninsula was secured payne and abbott were placed in this line under cover of the fire of the fleet which now worked with splendid zeal and activity under the stimulus of the hope and gratification occasioned by the return of the army ames's division with curtis in the lead moved down the river to within six hundred yards of the fort where terry curtis and comstock made a careful reconnaissance curtis felt himself at home on this ground he was as ready as ever to assault and an attack was arranged for the afternoon of the fifteenth ames was to move on the land face with his division and the navy inspired by a noble emulation undertook to attack the bastion at the sea angle at the same time in the morning porter began and carried on perhaps the most tremendous fire to which a fort has ever been subjected from a fleet nothing could withstand the rain of projectiles which he poured upon fort fisher at first the confederate cannoneers stood stoutly enough to their guns while the infantry huddled in their bomb-proofs but the fire was too hot for human endurance one by one the guns of the fort were dismounted or destroyed until hardly a response came from the parapets to the thunder of the ships at two o'clock curtis began to move forward against the land face of the fort galosha pennypacker and lewis bell following in close support they went forward rapidly availing themselves of every inequality of the ground under a severe fire of musketry until being near enough for the final rush the fleet was signalled to change the direction of its fire and curtis led his brigade directly at the bastion by the river at the same instant the naval force gallantly led by commander k r brice attempted to storm the bastion on the sea beach this attempt failed with the loss of many brave men notably of lieutenants s w preston and b h porter two of the most brilliant and promising officers in the service but the diversion thus made was of great advantage to curtis in distracting the attention of the garrison at a critical moment the irresistible rush of his brigade carried them over the parapet and pennypacker gained the palisade from the earthwork to the river they were both now inside the works and ready to take them in reverse but here they found that their labour was only begun the system of traverses was so complete that it required nearly a dozen separate actions to carry the fort the garrison under colonel william lamb an officer of high bravery and intelligence fought with desperate courage but the progress of the national soldiers though slow and hotly disputed was never once checked the routed sailors and marines took charge of the line in the rear and abbott was set free to reinforce the storming party in the traverses it was growing dark when the last rush was made which cleared the fort it was a well-won victory not likely gained curtis was terribly wounded in the head pennypacker had a severe wound the gallant bell was killed at the head of his brigade the garrison fled to fort buchanan at the southern extremity of federal point where late in the evening they surrendered colonel lamb and general w h c whiting the latter having taken part in the action though not in command both severely wounded were taken prisoners the forts at the mouth of the river were immediately abandoned rendering the victory complete and extremely valuable one hundred and sixty-nine cannons in all were captured and more than two thousand prisoners but better than all this the fleet could now enter the harbour and the days of blockade running were at an end a comical afterpiece here as at savannah followed the great drama two english vessels after the fort had been taken made their way by night through the fleet and gave the customary signals which were answered satisfactorily by general terry under the dictation of an intelligent negro the vessels came in their officers reported and were informed that their ships were prizes on the day that terry was preparing to storm fort fisher general schofield receiving his orders from grant to move the twenty third corps to the east he came as rapidly as possible by river and by rail to washington and reporting in person to grant at fort monroe went with him to fort fisher where with terry and porter the plan of the coming campaign was arranged 
schofield was placed in command of the new department of north carolina and the first task assigned to him was the capture of wilmington to serve as a base for sherman if anything should interrupt his march to goldsboro and next to open the route from newburn to goldsboro and concentrate his army there to meet sherman and be ready for any duty which the exigencies of the campaign might require the first division of the western troops that arrived was that of general j d cox followed a few days later by part of d n couches and with these and terry's force schofield moved on wilmington the confederate general hoke had entrenched himself with his own and what was left of whiting's troops across federal point on a line from myrtle sound to cape fear river and beyond the river a heavy earthwork called fort anderson guarded the right bank cox and ames marched against this position on the seventeenth by the right bank of the stream terry moved up the left bank a strong force of gunboats between them schofield kept his headquarters on a steamboat the fort was attacked by the fleet at long range and two of cox's brigades demonstrated against it while the rest of his force made a detour to the west to come in upon its rear thus threatened from every side the confederate garrison evacuated the place abandoning ten pieces of heavy ordnance and retreating to town creek halfway to wilmington halted in a strong position well covered by swamps ames with his division went back to the left bank where hoke's principal force was opposing terry cox cleverly turned the confederate position at town creek and coming in upon their rear dislodged and routed them capturing two guns and nearly four hundred prisoners the rest of them made their escape to wilmington cox pushed on with great energy the next day and came opposite to the city which was shrouded in smoke and gave other signs of evacuation terry had been stoutly resisted by hoke who was covering his purpose of retreat by this judicious action and schofield had ordered cox to cross the river and join the army on the left bank but cox seeing that wilmington was in extremity took the responsibility of disobeying his orders and explaining the situation to schofield his conduct was approved and at daybreak on the twenty second of february schofield celebrated the birthday of washington by an unopposed entry into wilmington the next thing to be done was to gain possession of goldsboro the point designated for the junction with sherman it was decided that new Bern afforded a better base for that movement as well as for sherman's subsequent operations than wilmington cox was therefore sent to new Bern to prepare it for that purpose and to set on foot the necessary repairs to the railway between new Bern and goldsboro in the prosecution of this work he advanced to the neighborhood of kingston on the news river about half-way to goldsboro where on the morning of the eighth of march he was attacked with great spirit by the confederate forces under general bragg consisting of hoke's command and some of the debris of hood's army one of cox's regiments in advance of his main line was routed and captured the ease with which this success was achieved was most encouraging to bragg who came up energetically against cox's force in position but was easily repulsed the attack was renewed the next day with unabated courage and although the confederates were again repulsed general schofield who had arrived on the field sent urgent orders to couch to hasten his march across country from wilmington before he arrived bragg had retired through goldsboro to concentrate with the rest of johnston's force who were preparing to resist sherman's northward march schofield occupied kinston on the fourteenth bridged the news and opened up communication with new Bern by river terry marching directly upon goldsboro from wilmington secured the crossing of the news south of that city which schofield occupied on the twenty first of march and made ready for the reception of sherman who on the twenty third here completed his march through the carolinas End of chapter three